James chapter number three again this evening, and we are just to, to kind of preface again where we have been. We've been talking about being rooted in several things. First of all, being rooted in Jesus Christ, being rooted in the Word of God, being rooted in God's wisdom, being rooted in the truth. Right now, we are talking about being rooted in God's wisdom. Of course, this is to be dif differentiated from the world's wisdom. As we talked about being rooted in wisdom, we first looked at the demonstration of godly wisdom. How is godly wisdom seen? How is it noticed? How, are, how is it shown? And we said that godly wisdom is demonstrated or shown in our works. People can watch us and see the demonstration of godly wisdom. It is also shown in our spirit, not just the things that we do, but also in how we go about doing those things. Last week, we looked at the devaluation of godly wisdom. In other words, about how God's wisdom has been devalued in our society, and not even just in the world society, but also within the church in many cases as well. We said that it is devalued when we are divisive. What do we have that the world should desire if we fight amongst ourselves and tear our own selves to pieces? What in the world would we have that they would want? It is devalued when we are divisive. It is devalued when we are devilish. And we looked at the, the passage there in James 3, verses 15 and 16, where he says that this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. And how the, what, what devilish is here, uh, it is not proceeding from God. It is proceeding apart from God, earthly sensual, and devilish. But tonight, here in verse number 17, we look at a more positive side of things. Look at James 3, and we will read, uh, back, starting in verse number 13, we'll go up to verse number 17. It says this, Who is a wise man, endued with knowledge among you? Well, let him Look, let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have a bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envyings and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Tonight we're going to look at the dignity of godly wisdom. When we as Christians choose by our <clears throat> walk with God to showcase godly wisdom, it is going to evidence itself, yes, in our works and in our spirit, like we talked about at the beginning of this section, but also it is going to evidence itself in other ways. What is godly wisdom? Well, first of all, we, are, we see here that godly wisdom is first pure. This is wisdom that comes from God. It comes from heaven, from Christ. It is an absolutely priceless treasure, purity is a priceless treasure. No doubt when you were young, you heard or saw an analogy very similar to this. And I, I you know, went to school in a Christian school growing up, and I remember preachers coming in and using this analogy concerning purity. And he took an apple or a banana or a piece of fruit, and he, uh, I think it was usually an apple, and he said, here, I want you to take this, and I want everybody to look at the apple over and look and see if you find any spots or blemishes or pro problems with the apple and just pass it down the rows until everybody's had a chance uh, to take a look at this apple. And of course, it goes down the elementary lines and it goes down the junior high and it goes down the high school lines. And everybody takes a look at the apple. And of course, we're all wondering why. And we take it and we turn it around our hands and we turn it over and we look at it from all sides and it makes it to the teacher and the teacher carries it back up to the preacher at the front. And he says, now, You've all had an opportunity to look at this apple. 
How many of you would like to take a big old bite out of this apple right now? And of course, we're all like, uh, no. <laughs> well, why? Well, the elementary kids, man, they're wiping their noses. Who knows if they washed their hands after they went to the bathroom and they had their hands, all of them, all over that apple. I don't want to take a bite out of the apple. Not only that, everybody has their hands all over that apple. No one wants to take a bite out of that apple anymore, do they? Because it's been contaminated. It's no longer pure. We're afraid to put that in our mouth. And they would use that image or that illustration to then help us as young people who hopefully at that point are still pure to value our purity because once it has been defiled, it's been defiled. Think about God's wisdom and the purity of God's wisdom. God is holy. He is undefiled. That means that God does not have to battle on a daily basis with a fallen mind like you and I have to battle with. And forgetfulness, that's just the beginning of it, right? And and, and some of us are more forgetful than others. And then there's also maybe some chemical imbalances that cause us to be angry or spiteful or other things like that. You know, we have to battle with our mind, our fallen mind, our impure mind on a daily basis. All of us have to. When it comes to pride, when it comes to anger, when it comes to all sorts of things, we battle with that mind. But you see, there's times when we can be especially wise, right? Sometimes I'll read something I wrote in the past and I'll think, man, that sounded really good. I'm I'm amazed at myself, you know? And of course, there's other things where I would would rather nobody ever hear me have said or written. (laughs) You know, I can't believe I wrote that. Man, that's horrible. (laughs) Uh, Sometimes I amaze myself and sometimes I greatly disappoint myself. But you see, God doesn't have those times. Nothing's ever occurred to God. You've heard that. You know, has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? You've heard that saying, no doubt, before. God's wisdom, he does not have to battle with down times or discouraging times. He doesn't have to battle with his flesh. When God gives wisdom through the word of God, we don't have to sift through it, chewing up the meat and spinning out the bones. Sometimes, you know, we read books that, yeah, we don't agree with people on everything. And that happens a lot of things like with Spurgeon, you know, I don't agree with him on on everything, but I'll tell you what, he's got some good stuff that he has said uh, and says it in a way that really clicks with me sometimes. And, And, you know, the same thing with other people. And so we often use that saying as, you know, well, I chew up the meat and spit out the bones. You know, I'm going to read it and I'm going to absorb it and take in the parts that are really good and the parts that aren't, I'm just going to chuck them out, the parts I don't agree with. But you see, when we look, when we read the word of God and we're seeking his wisdom, we don't have to do that. We don't have to say, okay, well, this part's still valid, but this part, you know, about disciplining our children, that's not valid anymore. Oh, this part about marriage, well, that's not really valid anymore. Uh, So I don't really need to pay attention to all of it. I get to pick and choose which parts I want. And that's the way the world approaches scriptures. They'll say, well, these parts of the Bible about encouragement, you know, we like that stuff, the goodly things, we like that stuff. And too many churches are that way. We want the encouraging things, the the health and the wealth things. We want the good things. And so we will cherry pick from scriptures the parts we want, but there's some other parts about, you know, the worms where the worm dieth not. We're not really, we're not really, you know, interested in that part of the Bible. We put that aside, but understand this. God's wisdom is pure. There is not a shadow of carnality. Carn means flesh. Adds a new meaning to carnival, right? Carn means flesh. There is no fleshliness to God's wisdom. It is pure. It is reverential. It is free of pride. It is free of divisiveness. And it can be evidenced through a person when they don't make decisions that are are based on the counsel of the unsaved. It's evident through the man that that chooses not to laugh at a a wicked joke. It's evidenced through a a woman who, who chooses to serve God from a true servant's heart. And you can see the pure wisdom of God being evidenced even in a young child, as they learn from their Sunday school teacher how they ought to respond or behave in a specific situation. And as a result, a friend maybe makes fun of God or a friend uses a bad word or a friend makes a bad joke. And that young child says, no, that's not right. And you see in them evidenced a pureness of wisdom. 
Colossians 2, 3 says this, In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. God's wisdom produces dignity. I used the word dignity last week, and I said how we could walk away from this building in one of two ways. We could walk away from it dignified. In other words, I'm too good to need to repent. I'm too good to need to uh, kneel at the altar. I'm too good to need you know, to seek uh, God's face this morning, to change my ways. I'm too good for that. I've been saved too long to need any of that stuff. We can walk away dignified. And many would walk, come to a church service and they would hear the gospel presented and they would say, I don't need any of that because I'm not really that bad of a person. Rather than kneeling down before God in the sight of these people, I will walk out those doors dignified rather than justified. But dignity can be a good thing. Dignity has this idea of being able to stand up on one's two feet, having shoulders back and head up, not out of pride, but out of a knowledge of righteousness. Not that I am perfectly righteous, no but I've placed my faith in one who is. And so I am not going to have to, to stoop my shoulders and lower my head down in shame because of the things that I am doing and saying, I'm going to try to live uprightly, sometimes faultily. But God's wisdom brings dignity. I don't have to hide it. I don't have to be ashamed of it. I don't have to cower away from the view of men when I am choosing to use God's wisdom in my life concerning my marriage or my family or my church or my business or my future or anything. If I'm choosing to use godly biblical wisdom in those areas, then I can stand up with my head held high. Because even if the world doesn't understand, even if the world points and laughs and says, why in the world would you believe such an antiquated thing? It is godly wisdom and so it is pure. It means there is no defilement in it. So I don't have to worry if you point your fingers and laugh at me or if you hiss at me. As a pastor said one time, he preached at a funeral for a public school teacher and he said the whole room was filled with, with public school teachers and he said they were his, literally hissing at him while he was preaching. Uh, he got out of there quickly afterwards. It was Broward County, you know, not Augusta County, more conservative area up here, but... Uh, he says it was a very, very, very unfriendly place to him after that. Um, you know, whether or not they're hissing at you because you're, you, you, you deign to stand in front of them and speak verses of Scripture before them, to talk about God and heaven and hell before them. You see, God's wisdom is pure. It brings dignity in that sense. Go ahead and make fun of me. Go ahead and tear me down. Go ahead and throw me in prison. Go ahead and burn me at the stake. But you know this, I understand it's not because of anything I've done. I am being persecuted for God's cause. And so I can hold my head high. It says it is first pure. And then it says it is peaceable. It is peaceable. Understand this about peace. The world does not know peace. The world does not understand what peace is. They only understand a fake peace. Peace. They're not years ago, just a few years ago, there were protesters standing over there in front of the Shannon, in front of the sheriff's office, shouting, "No justice, no peace, no justice, no peace." And of course, that same sentiment has been heard the world around in, the, in recent years. If there is no justice, then there will be no peace. In other words, if we don't get the results that we want or what we deem to be justice, then we will not let you or the people living here live in any form of peace. And that is literally what they are saying, but of course, what comes to our mind as Christians often is there is no peace, saith my God, for the wicked. There is no peace for the wicked. They will never understand or know peace, but God's wisdom brings peace. Many of our trials, our discomforts, our miscommunications, our family struggles, our employer relationship problems, other agitations that we have in our lives or in our relationships, they come as, an, as a result of an absence of wisdom. Because we're choosing to not operate under godly wisdom or to not operate in the spirit, we have employer-employee relationship problems. We have husband-wife problems or mother and father and child problems, family struggles, miscommunications, trials, even those within the church. Those come because of a lack of godly wisdom. I saw somebody pull in, so I might want to make sure they can get in. 
With wisdom comes peace. There are three areas here where uh, areas of peace that we can find through godly wisdom. These are some important areas here. Three areas of peace we can find um, in God. The first is this, peace with God. Peace with God. Romans 5.1 says this, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. This idea of being justified by faith was a great surprise to Martin Luther. We've been talking about the Protestant Reformation and getting into that in our church history series. And the just shall live by faith, you know, Romans, I think it was uh, 1019, you know, really, or 119, I don't remember, but uh, really stuck out to him uh, and, and really was one of the major parts that changed his mind. How can I then have peace with God? In other words, how can I stand before the great holy judge that is God and not have anything between me and him that would cause me to hide my face away? Moses could not look upon the face of God. Moses only looked upon the brief coattails of God, and it was too much for him. It, uh, it overwhelmed his face with its brightness, and he had to turn and look away. And then even beyond that, that brightness of, of God's glory just shone upon his face. And so much so that Moses had to wear a veil over his head because it was too much for the people. Moses could not look upon the glory of God. How can we have peace with God then? You and I, on a daily basis, we have faults. You and I, on a daily basis, we dirty ourselves up. How then can we go and stand before God's thrice holy face? Remember when Isaiah fell down before, he found himself before the throne of God? Man, he couldn't stand. He couldn't lift up his eyes. I'm a sinner. I can't even, I can't even be here before your throne. I cannot meet your gaze. Isaiah did not feel like there was peace there. How can you and I find peace between us and God? It's an easy question, scripturally, because Romans 5.1, as I read, says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, in these three areas of peace we can find with God, first area of peace that we can find is we can have peace with God. What's the second area of peace? that we can have with God. The second is inner peace. This is the peace that comes when our hearts and minds are fully trusting in the Lord. Peace, or this inner peace. We sing that song, You have longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase and have fervently, earnestly prayed. I might have messed up the words a little bit there. But you have longed for sweet peace. Many a night in turmoil, in our stomachs, we roll upon the bed because we're struggling with inner peace. We're struggling, wrestling with something in our hearts. And we desire, we long for inner peace. In the lost world, how do they desire, how do they seek after inner peace? They go to things that they feel like will fulfill them. Maybe this avenue will fulfill me. Maybe if I pursue music or if I pursue art, that this will bring some sort of fulfillment to me, some sort of inner peace, something that will fill that emptiness within me, that emptiness which is meaning and purpose, which is God. And so they try to pursue that. They try to pursue career and money. And boy, if I can just be successful, then mom and dad will be proud of me and I will have found meaning in my life. If I pursue this, if I pursue that, if I give money to charity, then I will find some sort of peace on the inside. Some go and try to find peace in other ways, at the bottom of a bottle. And they, they drink, and they drink, and they drink. And what does that bottle often have a tendency to do to us? It oft, most often has a tendency to magnify the problems that we have. Not just while we are drunken, but the problems and the, the consequences of our sin are magnified on the other side of it as well. 
only making us want to go back to it even more. How does the world seek peace? Inner peace. Philippians 4, 6 reminds us this, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Inner peace is a result of knowing that God is the source of all we want and need. Not Amazon, not Walmart, not the career, not our boss, not the higher-ups, not myself. How do I achieve inner peace? I achieve inner peace when I am looking at the correct source of peace. So one, the first area of peace that we can find with God was peace with God. That I can stand before God justified, not because of myself or my own abilities, not because I am good in any way, but because of the blood of Jesus Christ and my faith in what Christ has done, I can stand before Him justified just as if I had never sinned, righteous before God, not my own righteousness, but bearing the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And therefore, there can be peace between me and God. And then there was the inner peace. The inner peace that I can be at peace with myself. How could I ever be at peace with myself if there are still areas in which I am lacking? The world will never know. But I can be at peace with myself if I am turning to the appropriate source for peace. The third area of peace that we can have with God is peace with others. This is the fruit of godly wisdom. Matthew 5, 9 says this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We are instructed to be peacemakers. Now, I don't know if everybody got the, the memo on that one, <laughs> but we are instructed to be peacemakers. Let me let you in a little bit of sec a little secret here that I learned when I became an adult. When I became an adult and began working in a church, I realized suddenly, and to my great disappointment, how much politicizing went on amongst the adults within the church, how much backbiting and backstabbing went on, how precarious sometimes the pastor's position was within the church. And that came to much Displeasure, I thought, man, my church like this growing up was not like this at all when I was growing up. Foolishly, I thought that. It probably was. Because every church has some divisions. Every church has some problems. And a church that does not have major divisions is a church that is moving in unison in the same direction for the same purposes and goals. What causes divisions? When some people are moving for the Lord and others want to stay on the sidelines. This causes gaps and it causes divisions. But we are called to be peacemakers. That does not mean that there is always going to be perfect peace within the walls of this church or every church. There will be problems between people. Well, we talked about it this morning. Only by pride cometh contention, the Bible says, but with the well-advised is peace. There will be problems between people. But are we supposed to lean into those divisions, lean into those problems, to draw the lines and to take sides and to carry it on because we know we're right and they're definitely wrong. Gray carpet would not look good in this auditorium and we are not, you know, we're going to die on this hill. You know, there's some things that are worth dying for. Carpet's not one of them. I'd walk on dirt in this church if it meant having peace. Unity within the brethren. Blessed are the peacemakers. You can see an evidence of peace and godly wisdom when there is peace with others. It's easy to believe life would be peaceful if everybody else would just agree with us. If everybody else would just get their act together and see things the way I see things, then you know, of course we could all be at peace. I read a story, and as a, a father of young children, I completely relate this could have easily happened in my house. It probably has. A mother made some pancakes for her boys, Kevin and Ryan. As they were fighting over who was going to get the first biggest pancake, mom thought, I'm going to teach them a spiritual lesson here. She said, boys, if Jesus were here, do you know what he would say? He would say, let my brother have the first pancake. Kevin looked at Ryan and said, Ryan, you be Jesus. 
<laughs> God's wisdom says that if we'll be more like Jesus, we'll have peace. And so as we're, we're looking here on a series of bearing spiritual fruit, we have started looking at the root system, that which is below the ground. The most important part, we can put on fruit, we can put on leaves, we can put on all the good stuff that makes us look Christian, but it's not going to last and it's not going to have any power to it. There's not going to be any sweetness to that fruit. But if we look at the root system and make sure that we're rooted in the right things, then the fruit that gets produced as a byproduct is going to be sweet. And so we looked at the root system and being rooted in Christ and being rooted in God's word and being rooted in truth and now being rooted in wisdom. We looked at the demonstration of wisdom and how to show it on the outside. We looked last week at the devaluation of wisdom. Now we are looking here at the dignity of God's wisdom. It says there in James chapter 3, in case you're unaware of where we are, James chapter 3, we saw in verse number 17 that wisdom is first pure and then it is peaceable. What else is it? Well, we see it is peaceable. It is gentle and easy to be entreated. I like this. Gentle, easy to be entreated. That means it is patient. Godly wisdom is gentle wisdom. It, it mean, being easy to be entreated means that it is fair. It is compliant. It is being able to disagree without being disagreeable. Was that, would that describe you? Being able to disagree with somebody without being disagreeable? Easy to be entreated means it's easy to come up to you or to this person and to have a conversation with them. Sometimes an awkward conversation. As a, as a principal, uh, I would have to have some awkward conversations with parents at times, ones that I wish I never had to have, or some very awkward phone calls. But somebody who is easy to be entreated You've met people like this. They, they, they're, they're working overtime to make sure that you feel at ease. Even if you have something uncomfortable to say to them, they're working overtime to make sure that you feel at ease. Even if you're the one that's poking or prodding. Even if you're the one that is stirring things up a little bit. This person is full of mercy. These are qualities that, are, that truly are distinguished in our lives. But understand this, you know, distinguished in our lives as Christians, if we are bearing spiritual fruit, but understand this, we, we really only recognize these fruits when we're being tested. It's one thing to say I'm a peaceable person when I'm sitting quietly on my couch and nobody's bothering me. And it's a whole nother story when the kids are making the loudest racket they have ever made in their entire life, all individually. The dog is tearing apart somebody's toy. There goes a shoe across the floor. You can't hear a single thing, a single word of what you're trying to watch or listen to. And, of course, your wife is trying to get you to get up and take the trash out, right? Oh, it's a whole other story when things aren't going so smoothly to still be peaceable, easy to be entreated, patient, gentle, and full of mercy. I can readily... <laughs> think of many times as a father of young children where I could not be described as gentle, easy to, be, easy to be entreated, full of mercy. Times where I've had enough. The hammer's coming down. But you see, we don't have a heavenly father like me. Praise the Lord, right? Don't get too excited about that one. We don't have a heavenly father with my faults my impatience, and we can learn from him this kind of patience. What is godly wisdom here in James 3? The wisdom that is godly wisdom is pure, and it is peaceable, and it is gentle. You will be able to see godly wisdom emanating from a man of God or a woman of God when you see gentleness coming from them, not just when everything's going smoothly, but even when there's a headache or a backache, when things aren't going well, and you still come up to them and ask them something that are still peaceable and gentle with you. Are we being gentle when we're yelling at? Are we being compliant when somebody's being bossy to us? Are we being merciful when somebody is lying about us? Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you 
with all malice, it says. Take those things, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, and you take all those things and you put them in the trash bag. In fact, it's probably better with all the raccoons that we have around here that you double bag that, okay? And you tie it up good and tight and you put it away from you with all malice. And then in verse 32, it reminds us, and be ye kind one to another. Hey, hey, that'd be good for a reminder for us before we walk in the doors of church and be ye kind one to another. Hey, that'd be a good reminder for us before we get into the van with our family, <laughs> be ye kind one to another. The kids have gotten to the point where they're not allowed to bring any toys into the van anytime we go because it always turns into a fight over who gets what toy. So nope, no more toys. We're, we're done with this. Be ye kind one to another. But it's not just for kids. Tenderhearted. Tenderhearted. You know what that means? That means that as a man, it's very easy for me to get calloused it's very easy for me to not recognize others' pain. It's very easy for me to not be very tender-hearted towards somebody else's problems. What to me seem like no big deal to them may seem so. To be tender-hearted. Oh, here's one that, that, that gets harder the older you get. Forgiving one another. That I means forgiving the guy down the street that stole from you. Or forgiving uh, the person uh, in church from years ago that said something unkind about you or lied about you. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Let me ask you this. If somebody in this church were to have wronged you in all of the ways that you have wronged God, would you readily not just forgive that person for all of those things that you have done against God, but would you go beyond that and offer up your only child to be a sacrifice for them? And that's humbling to think about that, isn't it? Would you be even able to forgive them? If they were to have lied to you or about you the number of times you've lied. Man, that'd be hard to forgive. But yet God has forgiven us of that. How dare we not forgive others? How dare we not be tenderhearted? How dare we not be kind? So we see that the peace of God is first, I'm sorry, that the wisdom of God is first pure. It is peaceable, it is patient, but it is also productive. Look again at verse number 17. First pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated. Then it says, full of mercy and good fruits. Full of mercy and good fruits. It is full of good fruit. It's full of life. When you look at fruit, fruit has this, this uh, symbolism behind it of life. It is drawn from the nutrients of the soil. It is drawn from the rain that has fallen from the sky. It is drawn from the sunshine and, and the process that goes on within the leaves that then sends those sugars to that fruit to be able to plump it up nice. And so you see a good image of life within fruit. We see it evidenced in our lives through a desire, a spiritual life, a desire to witness, a desire to teach to share God's goodness with others. We see evidence of godly wisdom in our lives when we have that song in our heart. A song in our heart through God's Word. It says in Colossians 3.16, another verse you probably know very well and could quote with me, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. You know what my favorite kind of dessert is? Definitely not pecan pie. <laughs> Oh, key lime. Okay, well, okay, I like pecan, I like key lime pie, that's for sure. But it's not my favorite. No, my wife told me I'm not allowed to talk about desserts anymore because then people bring it to me and then I get fat. Um, okay, I'm going to anyways. But you know what my favorite kind of, of dessert is? Uh, chocolate cake, like triple layer death by chocolate cake. And not with the fluffy chocolate icing, but with the rich, thick chocolate icing. That stuff, that's the, like that bomb cake. That Yeah, I tried to find that the other day in, public, in the food line and couldn't find it. Our, that's why I couldn't find it. Anyways, you know, that's, that's some good stuff right there. It's rich, but you can't take very much of it at one time, can you? You try to eat an entire slice of that, and it's just a little too much sometimes. Think about this, the verse that I just read. Let the, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Richly. You take it, and you compact it. And you just fit so much of that good stuff in there that people can't take more than a taste of you at a time, right? Now, not quite that bad, I guess, but 
Will you fit all of the Word of God in you? Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Godly wisdom is productive. It produces fruit. And as we've said many times throughout this study, spiritual fruit cannot be produced. It is a byproduct. I cannot just determine to produce spiritual fruit one at a time. I have to first plant my roots where they belong. And that's why we are in the section we are. I plant my roots. I look at my roots. I check my root health because that is where it all begins. The part that nobody ever sees the part that the people with church don't get to witness. Oh, they might see you're dressed up. They might see you singing the hymns. They might see you praying. They might see you at the altar. But they do not see what goes on beneath the surface. And that's the most important part. That's the part that ensures and protects spiritual success. And godly wisdom is productive. Let me ask you, before we move on in the list, is the wisdom that is shown through you pure? I know we're all faulty. We do have areas where we lack. And that will continue to be the case until we die and get our purified bodies, our new bodies, and we get to stand before God. And we don't have to battle with that stuff anymore. But do you recognize pure godly wisdom in your life? Do you recognize peaceable godly wisdom in your life? Or do you use your wisdom to battle? and divide, and fight? Do you recognize patient, godly wisdom? My mom always said, never pray for patience, because that's not one that you really want to answer, <laughs> because you have to learn patience. Uh, and so I used to think when I was teaching down in, 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 in Florida, I used to pray and ask, God, wh why, what am I going to need patience for? Why are you putting me through this? Like, why are you building my patience right now? What am I going to have to deal with one day? Is your, the wisdom patient? Is it productive? Or does the wisdom that you're relying upon only protect itself? Also, or lastly, that it is without pretense. Look again back at verse number 17. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated full of mercy and good fruits, look at this, without partiality and without hypocrisy. God's wisdom is evidence in a life that never presents itself as something that it isn't. Putting up that facade, putting up the front that we're this good Christian on Sundays that we don't, we don't back up the rest of the week. The person who's walking in God's wisdom, they're full of truth and love. Oh yes, the truth. Oh yeah, God's love, you know, the love of God. I love God. God loves me. I love everybody. But then on Tuesday, they cut you off and you have a few unloving <laughs> words that you want to say to somebody in the car next to you. Being full of truth and love means no matter how you cut me, no matter when you run into me, no matter how low I've burned throughout the day, whenever you find me, every part of me is full of truth and love. And so even if I'm tired, you're going to find tired truth and love. And even if I'm frustrated, you're going to find frustrated truth and love in me. And even if I've been worn down, even if I'm old in years, you're going to find truth and love. That is the godly wisdom that we ought to be desiring from the Word of God, that we ought to be rooting our lives into. Are you rooted in God's wisdom. Man has wise things to say. He has books of wisdom. But it's all been plagiarized. It's all been plagiarized from the Word of God. And they won't even give credit to God for the wisdom that they give for their many matters. And much of that wisdom is man-centered and much of that wisdom is wrong because it will lead to places other than this. You think about this. man says that we need to be vengeful. Man says that we need to hurt others in the same way that we have hurt that we have been hurt and even more so. Man says that that is how we are to respond to pain in our lives. God's wisdom says the exact opposite of that. So how do you recognize God's wisdom? Well, you can see it demonstrated in people's lives. How? Well, like what we see here in verse number 17. 
1 Peter 1.22 says this, Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Unfeigned love of the brethren. It's not just, oh, bless you, God bless you on Sundays, and I don't know you on Wednesdays. It is unfeigned, not faked love for one another. Who would turn down the results of this wisdom? To think that we could be rooted in pureness, in peaceableness, in patient productiveness, and without pretense. Man, what an opportunity that we have as Christians to root ourselves into those things and so that those things can then become part of the fruit that we produce. But yet, we turn those blessings down when we, cho when we choose to not seek God's wisdom. When we choose to seek man's wisdom, or even worse, when we just take God's wisdom and we close it and set it on the coffee table, or we leave it on the pew at church, and we don't choose to open it ever, we have rejected godly wisdom. Is it any wonder then that peaceableness is not a part of our life? Is it any wonder then that pretense becomes a natural necessity in our life because we have to keep up the image, even if pureness and even if peaceableness and even if all of those other things are not a part of my life, I have to keep up the front. And thus comes pretense. Godly wisdom is a priceless treasure and it is not one that we should take for granted. One of the signs that we have been rooted in Christ, and that was the very first place we started, one of the signs that we have been rooted in Christ is that we have a heart that seeks after wisdom. And we've talked many times about how to find wisdom. It's not hidden away in some deep, dark cave somewhere in Central America with the lost golden city and that no man will ever find. That's not where God put wisdom. He did not encode it so that the best uh, you know, decoders or the best you know, computer analysts would never be able to decipher God's wisdom. He did not give us a cipher and a key. The Bible says that wisdom crieth out in the streets. Wisdom can and will be found by those who simply open their eyes and their hearts and they search for it. The Bible says in Proverbs 3.13, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. Happy. Have you ever met? A spiritually mature Christian that's known for their wisdom, that's known for their Christ-like spirit. Maybe you can kind of picture their image in your mind. That person was probably a joyful individual too, weren't they? There was probably happiness in their life, not spitefulness or constant anger, but joyfulness. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom. So let your roots sink down deep into Christ. We continue here on talking about being rooted. Being rooted in Christ. Being rooted in the Word of God. Being rooted in the truth. Being rooted in wisdom. Next Sunday evening, we will look at being rooted in Christ's love. And we'll go to 1 John 4 when we look at that. Being rooted in Christ's love. Here is just basically a description of areas in which we need to make sure that we are sending roots down deep. The opportunities that we have as Christians to be able to produce these amazing spiritual fruits. But it all begins down at the roots. So, how is your root system doing today? Did you disappoint yourself this week? Yeah, probably. Did you disappoint God this week? Absolutely. We all did. That's not an excuse, and that doesn't make it okay, just because we all did it. I don't need to worry and focus about you know, areas in which you've disappointed God, unless you want me to. But I do need to focus on areas in which I've disappointed God and myself. And this week can be a week where changes are made. This week can be a week where I focus my roots in the places they ought to be. Again, remember that fruit is a byproduct of a right environment. And so make sure that your environment is right. Make sure that you are rooting your day in the Word of God. Rooting your day in the face of God by being in His presence and talking to Him and putting down deep roots 
every day there. And that is inevitably going to affect every part of your day, every part of your demeanor, every part of your responses or reactions. It is going to affect you throughout that entire day, being rooted in godly wisdom.